Uh, good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Sir, as um, everyone knows, we're sitting today between 11 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. And yep. um, certainly no later than 2.30 p.m. If it suits um, you, sir, I would propose that we take a half an hour's break um, between 12.30 and 1 p.m. so that the evidence sessions are split into two one-and-a-half-hour slots. That, that's fine by me, and I take it that's okay with the um, transcriber. Uh, we'll see how we go. Um, if um, it becomes a problem, then um, I'm sure she will let us know. Yeah, fine. So can I call um, David Posnet, please? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Good morning, Mr. Posnet. My name is Jason Beer, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you please tell us your full name, please? Uh, David Posnet. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to give evidence to the inquiry today and for the provision um, of a detailed witness statement to assist us in our investigation. Can we start by looking at that document, please? I think you've got it in front of you at tab A1. It should be dated the 4th of October, 2023, and excluding the exhibits uh, index, it's 44 pages in length. Yes, that's correct. Um, is that your signature on page 44? It is, yes. And are the contents of that witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, thank you. Now, a copy of that is going to be uploaded to the inquiry's website. I'm not going to ask you questions about every part of it, just um, selected elements of it. And you're to, uh, here today to assist us uh, with the issues arising in phase four of the inquiry, which is the investigation and prosecution of sub-postmasters for criminal offences. Can I start, please, with your um, uh, career? I think you worked for the post office for 31 years. Is that right? That is right, yes. Um, I think you started in 87, is that right? It was 1986. 86, that's right, and finished in 2017. That's correct, yes. So 86 to 2017, 31 yes. years. Yes. And you started life um, in the post office as a counter clerk, is that right? That's right, yeah. And I think that job lasted for eight years until um, about 95, is that right? Nine years till 95? About that, it's about that, yes. And then in 1995, you started a new role as an auditor, is that right? That's correct. And whereabouts were you based as an auditor? I was based in Guildford. And did you have any um, professional or other qualifications to be an auditor? No. I think you stayed in that role for um, four years or so until 1999 when you took up a job as a, um, a joint business testing analyst. Is that right? Yeah, I think it was uh, the back end of 1999, yes. And we're going to come back to that in a moment because the work that you did there may be of um, relevance to the inquiry. And that lasted until 2000, is that right? It lasted until the end of December 2000, yes. Okay, so... It was a few months, um, yeah. So um, a year or so? No, it was, a, it was during 1999, about midway or, or a bit further, and it, I finished that role at the end of December 1999. Oh, it was just in um, 1999, was it? Yes. Right, OK. So about six months then? Maybe less than that, but roughly it was a few months. And um, in your statement, you say in 2000 you started work as an investigation manager based in Twickenham, is that right? Yes. And as an investigation manager, were you managing uh, investigations or managing people? Uh, investigations. Okay. Did you manage any people? No. Okay. Uh, you moved, I think, from Twickenham to Woking, and in 2004 you were promoted to an investigation team manager, is that right? That's correct. And did that mean that you then started managing people as well as investigations? Yes. And how many people were in the, the team that you managed? 
Um, it fluctuated, uh, but roughly between f four up to eight people. And did they all work in Woking too? No, they didn't. They were dispersed geographically. And did they homework, or did they have an office that um, they could come into? Back then, we had offices. Right. And how did you um, to monitor or supervise these four to eight people? Uh, did uh, regular one-to-ones. Um, I, I usually went to their office to, to conduct a one-to-one. -one. Might have been every month or six weeks or so. Um, and team meetings we'd sort of have at my office. So I'd generally go to them, but the one-to-ones, but team meetings that come to my office. And how um, frequently were the team meetings where everyone in the team came in? Ooh, probably every month or two. And were they scheduled? Um, we're having a team meeting every month or two. Uh, or were they only when the, the occasion arose? They were scheduled. We'd have a meeting, I think, and at that meeting we'd pencil in the date for the next meeting. And was there sort of a standing agenda for those? Some bits were standing agenda, uh, like any new, new um, post office related products or transactions, etc. Um, and also, I used to print off everybody's current cases, um, and that they could select a case or two if it was unusual and, t and talk about it. Um, and it was also used for. If, if somebody had a, an investigation and needed someone to help them on the, the day of um, when the operation concluded, you know, because we, we were all in the same room, we could all uh, sort those sort of things out. When an investigation um, manager submitted a file for a decision on prosecution, did that have to come through you before it got to legal services or to somebody else? I, th I think it went uh, direct to the casework team and then up to the criminal law team. So um, it, it didn't come th have to come through you? I don't think it came through me, but they would email me, um, for example, their reports, maybe. OK, so you would see something about the cases that were going off to the criminal law team um, yes, investigated okay. by members of your team? Yes. Would you um, conduct reviews of their files, the investigation managers? I didn't conduct reviews, um, but I did read, obviously, some of the reports. And what would cause you to read the reports? Um, because I'm their manager, just to make sure there wasn't any uh, horrendous errors or, or, or anything wrong. So you'd have a good idea of the things that you're uh, team were investigating the nature of the investigations that they were carrying out and the conclusions that they reached in their investigation reports? Yes. And to whom did you report in this period? I'm talking about 2004 onwards when you were the investigation team manager. When I was the investigation team manager, I reported initially to Manish Patel, who's a senior investigation manager. Um, and then I think after him it was Trevor Lockie. Um, I think they were, and then, then perhaps Dave Pardo after that. And was there only one senior investigation manager? I believe so, yes. I think you stayed in that role until 2007, is that right? Yes. And in that year, 2007 and then 2008, you worked as a casework manager based in Croydon, is that right? It was, yes, for a number of months between 07 and 08, yes. What was the um, function of the casework team in Croydon? The function of the casework team was, it was sort of split into two. On one side was banking, um, the post office card account. So there was an assistant manager and some admin staff who primarily dealt with um, DPA requests from law enforcement uh, in relation to uh, the Data project. Protection Act requests. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and then the other side was another assistant manager and admin staff who dealt with um, uh, investigations, 
So, as I mentioned earlier, the, the case file would come into the casework team. Uh, they'd complete a spreadsheet with, I don't know, date of interview um, or date of summons or, or anything relating to the case. Um, and then they would send that up to the criminal law team. So what was the, what did they add, the casework team? What was their uh, purpose, their function, if you like? The, the bits, that, not the banking side, the investigation side. On the investigation side, with, with the spreadsheet that we used, which was, I can remember, was horrendous. It was um, the movement of the case uh, throughout its life cycle um, and to ensure that it's dispatched to the relevant people and emails uh, sent to uh, relevant stakeholders. Um, so it was... It's like the central admin for uh, a case. And was it only an administrative function, or did it perform any tasks of, um, of substance in relation to the investigation? In, in relation to the investigation, uh, possibly um, obtaining the order uh, requests from Fujitsu. Um. Anything else other than that? We're going to come back to that because, because I think you'll realise that's quite a big topic for the inquiry. So that, that function sat within the casework team in Croydon, obtaining audit data from Fujitsu. Yeah. Um, anything else? I can't think of at the moment. Anything else? And how many people worked within the casework team on the investigation side of the house? There was... Two or three. And they were managed by one assistant manager, is that right? That would include the... That would include the assistant, yeah. assistant manager. And you, did you sit underneath the assistant manager? I, I sat above the above, assistant okay. manager. And your title then was? Casework manager. Casework manager, okay. And at that time, to whom did you report? I think it was Dave Pardo at that stage. And was he based in the Croydon office? He wasn't, though. He's uh, up in St Helens, I think he, he lived. And did you um, have meetings with him, uh, regular contact with him, or because of the geographical um, uh, separation, not? I had contact with him. Um, I don't recall it being regular. And then I think in, um, later in 2008, you became a fraud risk manager, is that right? Yes. So that moved you out entirely of the casework team in Croydon, is that right? In, uh, yes. And that lasted until 2010? Yes. Uh, what did that job entail, fraud risk manager? It was primarily uh, running fraud risk programmes. <clears throat> um, for example, a fraud risk programme on... Uh, Crown Office cash losses, scratch cards, overnight cash holdings, um, post office card account, rejected postage labels. So I, I would say 90% of it was these particular products or transactions. Um, and we'd draft up um, a program um, to address uh, risks and weaknesses in those areas. And by a programme, do you mean a computer programme or a, a schedule of work? A schedule of work. Um, and it was the crime risk team that was based within the security admin team who identified these as more um, high-risk areas. Then I think in 2010, you uh, became an accredited financial investigator. Is that right? Yes. Yes. It took a while to get the accreditation, but yes. Uh, you stayed in that job until 2014, is that right? Yes. Uh, I think your accreditation was given by the MPIA, the National Police Improvement Agency. Is that right? That's right, yes. And what was your role as an accredited financial investigator? Uh, my role was basically um, to recover losses on behalf of the business. So this is essentially proceeds of crime work, is yes. that right? Yes. And was that all post-conviction work? A confiscation was post-conviction. Um, Pre-conviction would be things like restraint orders um, and production orders. 
And whereabouts were you based when you were an accredited financial investigator? That would have been in, I think, Old Street in London. Then in 2014 uh, and until 2015, you worked as a security and investigation team leader. Is that right? Yes. You retained your um, title as an accredited financial investigator. Is that right? That's right. Um, Did you do any financial investigation work? Yes, but it um, sloped off uh, during that period. I mean, I, to be honest, I, I did uh, many of the roles I'd previously done in that last year. As um, a security and investigation team leader, what was your function? Again, it was, um, as I described in uh, 2004, manage a team of people, uh, but it also had a, a security element at that stage. So the team would deal with burglaries, robberies, um, uh, cash centres, security visits, etc. And then finally, I think um, in 2015 until 2017, you were a branch standards manager. Branch standards field manager, yes. And what did a branch standards field manager do? The main thrust of that role was to check that uh, sub postmasters or staff were having the correct conversations with customers in relation to uh, items they were posting over the counter. Uh, one of the focus was um, whether items were prohibited or restricted um, and to make sure that they were asking the right questions. Was there any investigation uh, function within that role? No. Can we go back then, having looked at uh, briefly each uh, stage of your career in the uh, post office to the time that you were um, uh, involved in um, 1999 and um, I think your statement says uh, into 2000 as a joint business testing analyst for yep. um, Horizon. And can you help us, um, j just again, I think I missed it earlier, H how long you worked as a joint um, business testing analyst for Horizon 4? It, I, if it was mid-99, I definitely finished on the, on, at the end of December that year, so I would say six months, maybe a month or two more or less. And tell us what um, a joint business testing analyst in relation to Horizon did. Yeah, so there, I was based within ICL Pathway, as it, as it was known then. Um, so you mean physically based? Yes, they had offices in Felton. Um, and they had a, quite a large room called, the, I think it's called the Rig. And within that room were lots of computer terminals that reflected the names of post offices. Um, and they, they chose football teams. So you'd have Liverpool post office, which might be a, a single terminal. You could have Chelsea post office, which might have three terminals, a bigger, busy office uh, that would represent. Um, Slightly better post office, presumably. Uh, p potentially. <laughs> um, and, and my role, and a colleague who joined the same time as me, we would basically get scripts um, and we would literally have to follow these scripts. So it would say, go to Liverpool Post Office, log on, sell a first-class stamp, take cash for it, and literally just follow a basic script like that. Um, and so a rig was, it was a, a dummy system, is that right? Yes, yeah. Was it um, self-contained, a, a closed system, or did it um, connect with the outside world? I don't think it connected with the outside world. Um, and that's basically what we did, follow these scripts. And when we'd finished, we'd hand the, the script uh, over to, I think it was the back office team. So I don't know whether the system communicated with them, um, but that's what we did. It was just literally following these scripts. Were you um, aware in this time, as a testing analyst, of um, significant problems arising with the development and uh, testing of the Horizon system? I can recall two things. Number one, um, the, the system was meant to have uh, the benefits payment system attached to it, so to pay out pensions. 
and that was pulled, I think, during the time I was there, uh, which was quite a significant. I don't know the reasons why, but the government said we're not going to be going down that road. And the other noises, for want of a better word, I can remember were people said that Horizon was chosen, uh, sorry, Fujitsu or ICL Pathway were chosen because it was the cheapest option. So I don't know which other companies tendered for the uh, system, but Fujitsu or ICL Pathway were chosen. What about problems um, at an operational level with the system? Were you aware of, in this testing phase, um, with issues and problems with the operation of Horizon? I was aware of uh, issues whilst testing because that's what you do in the testing environment. That was the purpose of it. Yes. Um, but, but for example, you know, if, if the script said issue a, a motor vehicle licence, this is just an example, not an actual example, but you'd go to the screen and the motor vehicle licence wouldn't be there. So you'd, you'd have to annotate the script to say, can't perform this transaction because the icon's not there. So that would go back to the back office team and, and I think they would look at it, sorry, um, and then rectify that issue. The only problem I do remember was, I think there was a, a, a Northern Ireland icon. Um, and a Northern was, Ireland icon? Yes. And it was a picture of a, somebody with a green sweater and it was raised that perhaps this green sweater should be made purple because of the political situation. Were you um, aware of what happened when a problem arose in testing? You wanted to issue a DVLA licence and the script told you to, and it could, the, yeah. the system couldn't, and you, put, you handed in that script marked up in the way you said, saying, uh, can't do that function. Were you aware of the next steps, or were you a, sort of a, a smallish cog in a, in a larger set of machinery? Uh, I was a smallish cog. That would be re uh, relayed back to the back office team. And then after that, I don't know, we would then get another script to work on. Um, so you wouldn't see what the solution was to that problem or indeed whether there was a solution to it? I wouldn't see it. And to be honest, I wouldn't understand anyway if, 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 even if I did see it. And why wouldn't you understand if you did see it? Because that would be far too technical for me. I think it's right that you didn't have any... Uh, qualifications or experience in computing. No, is that? That, that's right, yeah. Were you aware at this time of um, something called AIs or acceptance incidents? Not that I recall, no. Uh, do you um, remember any of these testing issues um, affecting uh, settling accounts or balancing? No. Is that, um, it's 23 years ago now, and therefore I, um, I can't remember one way or another what each of the issues were, or I don't think any of them involved uh, balancing issues? I, again, I can't remember specific specifically 23 years ago, but there may have been, um, I mean, when I mentioned the scripts that we used, if it ended up with um, a cash account, for example, and before that there were problems in finding icons and, and things, we may not have finished the script because we couldn't end up doing the cash account that would come out the way it should have done. Um, but I, I can't remember. Can we um, just look at one example of maybe one of the things that you were doing when you were a joint business testing analyst by looking at FUJ 302 1692? Can you see this is um, a document called a pinnacle? Can you see that? I can, yes. Do you remember pinnacles? I can remember. The, the word pinnacle rings a bell, but I, I can't remember it. You can't remember what their function was or who issued them or 
No. But what their purpose was? No. We can see that this one was opened on the 2nd of June, 1998. Uh, thank you, Frankie. And uh, the summary of it to the left is EPOS. Do you remember what EPOS was? Is that electronic point of sale? Yes, um, and there was a problem. It says the transaction logs were not working with EPOS. Yeah. I take it you don't remember that as a problem? I don't remember that as a problem, um, and that was before I had that role anyway. That's what I wanted to ask you um, about, it, if I may. If we um, turn to page five, please. And look at the bottom half of the page. Thank you. Can you see, I think it's five lines in now. It says the BA stroke POCL reports and receipts document reflects the system. It does not specify the requirement for transaction logs the requirement to offer the same functionality as the existing system. Sorry, the requirement is to offer the same functionality as the existing system. Two joint testers, uh, Chris Phillips and Dave Posnett, are currently checking the transaction log functionality on Horizon, A, against the documented functionality of the existing system, B, for usability, which is what this pinnacle was originally raised for. So a number of questions arising from that. Firstly, this um, uh, pinnacle was raised in June 1998. Yeah. And this entry is in September 1998. And it refers to you, along with Chris Phillips, as a joint tester. Yes. Do you think you were, in fact, doing uh, joint testing or had the role as a joint tester earlier than you thought? Uh, if, if those dates are correct, then yes. <laughs> but I'm sure it was 1999. But Chris Phillips was the other guy who um, joined the same time as myself. I, I thought it was a few months in 99, because I can remember the, the millennium bug that we, everyone thought that all the computers in the world were going to stop. So I, I didn't think it was 1998. I may be wrong. If this is um, accurate and we've got no reason to think um, that th the dates on here are, um, are, are wrong, it looks like in the autumn of 98 you were performing the role of a joint tester. Yeah. And it refers to you um, checking the transaction log functionality on Horizon. That sounds something slightly different to running um, a script, seeing whether a, a test rig could uh, perform a function like issue a DVLA license. W would you agree? That element does sound different, yes. What you understand it is saying here, or it is recording you as doing, checking a transaction log functionality? It says that, yes. Yes, but w w what, what do you understand it to be referring to? Um, that we were trying to obtain transaction logs from the system within the rig. And what do you understand transaction logs to be? Um, a record of all the transactions entered on the terminal over a given time frame. Yes, thank you. That can come um, down, please. How um, collaborative was the joint testing team, i.e. how uh, much exchange of information was there between you about issues or problems with the system? Well, my recollection was, um, as I've outlined, we followed the scripts, and those scripts, whether they had worked out correctly or not, would pass to the back office team for review um, and to rectify anything if, if anything needed rectifying. 
When you left this role, what was your view as to the uh, reliability and integrity of the data that Horizon produced? I don't recall having uh, any concerns because although it was a new role for me, my understanding was that the testing environment was to test, 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 um, identify issues, and then people with more technical knowledge would rectify them. Um, so I, I don't think I gave it any, any serious thought. I thought that was par for the course for that particular role. What was the um, chat, the um, conversation, um, the feeling amongst those with whom you were working as to the adequacy or otherwise of the Horizon system? Was it seen as problematic or difficult? Were people saying, look, um, there are lots of problems with this. We've got a rollout coming around the corner, yeah. um, a deadline to meet. I don't recall any conversations, but I do recall that the, the rig was down quite often. So, for example, we'd have a script and we'd have to go and do some work, but the technicians were working on the rig, so they, they, to be honest, there were hours where we had to just get on with other things whilst we're waiting to go in. So there were problems. Um, but I wouldn't know what those problems were because we were just told when we could go in and start um, following the script again. So how, what was your overall impression of Horizon when you walked away from this job? It was a new computer system um, for all post offices. We mentioned EPOS there. I think it was also partly based on um, ECHO, which uh, Crown offices had. Had been using for a while? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, was there um, anything in particular about EPOS that had um, raised concerns about the operation and functionality of the EPOS system? Uh, not that I can recall, no. Uh, were you involved in um, any way in the training of sub-postmasters in the rollout of Horizon? No. Did you have any function concerning um, the rollout of Horizon? No. When I, when I finished that job um, at the end of 2000, uh, after Christmas, I then became an investigation manager, or temporarily became an investigation manager until there was interviews for the, for the posts uh, on a permanent basis. Again, when you left, w would you say that um, your experience was that testing had revealed some problems, no problems, or significant problems with the operation of Horizon? I would personally say some to significant because I, I don't know what the norm would be in terms of errors on a computer system uh, during a testing phase. Can you remember delays to the program of rollout due to technical problems with Horizon? No, all, all I can recall is I think it was meant to be rolled out in 2000 and it was rolled out in 2000. If, if there were a month or three delays, because uh, I wasn't in that role then, I, I don't know. Can we just look at something that you said about this period of time years later, in, in 2015, uh, by looking at two documents alongside each other, if we may. Um, firstly, poll 306, double 370. And secondly, poll 0011-8547. Thank you. We can see um, that this is a, um, on the left-hand side, a post office limited submission to a Bayes business um, innovation and skills or biz um, business innovation and skills committee um, inquiry into the post office mediation scheme uh, which was conducting an investigation in 2015 
That's the document on the left-hand side. Yep. And on the right-hand side, we can see in an email from you to Helen Dickinson and Rob King saying, I've trawled through this and made some comments, yellow and blue highlights. Not many, though, uh, as a lot of it is technical or not within my knowledge to comment further. Uh, witness statement associated to reflect horizon training. And you say, as an aside, in my personal view, I really do think that there are cases where horizon is clearly irrelevant. Uh, the sub postmaster admits theft, says what uh, he did with the money, etc. No grounds to even cite horizon. George Thompson mentioned the Rudkin case um, at the select committee hearing. There are others. And I think, without mentioning names, details, etc., we could be more on the front foot if these were flagged to MPs, second sight, etc. So the Parliament's conducting an inquiry, an investigation. Uh, the Post Office has given some evidence already um, through um, Mr. Thompson. And this is, a, on the left-hand side, a submission um, to uh, that parliamentary uh, committee and you've marked up this draft um, submission and can we just look at page five please on the left hand document and uh, have a look at training at 2.1 thank you uh, the post office was proposing to tell the committee that it heard evidence on the training available to sub-postmasters at the time of Horizon's introduction. This evidence focused on the pack of training materials provided to sub-postmasters at the relevant time, etc. And then next paragraph, as presented to the committee, one might left, be left with the impression that the training and support ended there. On the contrary, on the introduction of Horizon, two different training courses were then provided by ICL Pathway. The first was for sub-postmasters, the second was for staff. This training was delivered prior to the branch migrating to Horizon. All sub-postmasters left the course with a Horizon user guide, and they were also subsequently provided with, a quick reference gu with quick reference guides. And then I think the part that you added, this would have been marked blue or yellow in the um, original, it was, quote, it was also a pass-fail course so if they weren't up to scratch, they weren't allowed to work with Horizon. It wasn't a case of going through the motions. See associated witness statement, which may provide um, more ammunition. Now, this you were writing in 2015. Yes? Uh, yes. Yes? We've seen the email... The email, uh, yes. Enclosing this document with these markups on it. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. And what um, direct experience had you got of um, the provision of training to sub postmasters? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yes. What direct experience had you got of the provision of training to sub postmasters at, at the rollout stage? Um, none. But you're here providing um, ammunition, it says, or you say, to those that are compiling this um, submission to Parliament. If you had no direct experience of the provision of training to sub-postmasters, why were you providing the ammunition? Um, firstly, I don't remember or recall that document. Secondly, I think when we were um, investigating cases, one of the things we got on occasions were the training records. Um, and it would have been from those we were informed that it, it, it was a pass-fail course. So that's probably where I took that from. And so this addition that you're suggesting to the submission to Parliament 
comes from your knowledge, not from the period that I was talking about as a tester in rollout, but later when you were inv an investigator, is that right? Yes. And to what extent did you look into the adequacy of training as an investigator? Um, I think it was, if we obtained the, the part, well, it would have to be a pass, otherwise I wouldn't have been working in the post office. Um, and again, I can't remember, I don't, I don't know whether it was simply a pass or whether there was some text um, competent with this, okay with that, or issues with this, etc. So it, it gave a picture of a, a sub-postmaster or a clerk as to how well they were coping with the system during training. Did you investigate um, the quality of training? No. Uh, did you ever hear sub-postmasters say that the training that they received on Horizon was not adequate or satisfactory? I have heard that, uh, whether it was my cases or... I, I can't um, recollect specific examples, but that does ring a bell. And, and if I'm honest, when I trained to be a counter clerk, I think it was um, something like two or three weeks in a classroom and then two or three weeks with somebody sat behind me watching everything I did, whereas this is obviously a couple of days or one day's training. That wasn't the message that you were seeking to convey here, though. You, no, the you message... were providing ammo to beef up the post office's case to Parliament. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember this at all, what I was doing. I think that's factual. It was also a pass or fail course, etc. cetera. Um, but what it doesn't do is provide that more nuanced position that you've just expressed, namely, look, I, when I was a counter clerk, I spent two or three weeks being trained, and that was reduced to a couple of days, and then a, I think a day, and then even less. Yeah. Um, Having said that, these people may already have been sub-postmasters and clerks, so they would know how to work in a post office. I think this was purely the horizon training, not, not the full Monty of counter-clerk work. By this time, 2015, I realise we're jumping right ahead at the moment. Were you asked to provide positive views only when making comments on this document that was to sub be submitted to Parliament? I don't recall, because I don't recall the document. Would you naturally uh, only provide ammunition for the post office's case when making comments? I don't think so, no. You would express any negative uh, views of Horizon, the training of sub-postmasters, the operation, of um, uh, the system, the quality of investigations and the like too, would you? I'd like to have thought so, yes. Would uh, post office management, if we just go back to the email, uh, Helen Dickinson, you'll see that she was the security operation team leader north, yes? Do you remember her? Yes. Would post office management be receptive to um, bad news stories about Horizon in a, an exercise like this? Um. At the time, I, I think my view at the time was, if it was good news, it was good news. If it was bad news, it was bad news. Again, I don't recall it, but I'd like to, to think that, that I would have told the truth, you know, whichever side that fell on. And you didn't, wouldn't have felt any inhibition in 2015 of saying any... Um, giving uh, additions to this document that were uh, negative or uncomplimentary about Horizon? 
I wouldn't have an issue with that. Um, although at the time, the Indi or the messages were that there is nothing wrong with the system. Um, so whether that's reflected my mindset, but you know, I, I'd like to think if I saw something that, that wasn't right, I, I would say it. Okay, we'll be coming back to this um, uh, uh, later. Uh, that can come down, both those documents can come down, thank you. You um, uh, have told us already that you worked as an investigation manager between 2000 and 2004. Can we look please at poll 0010-6867 please? We start with page nine, please. This is part of a long email chain. Uh, years um, later, in 2010, and can you see that you're copied in on this email from um, Sue Lowther to a um, a group of people. Yes. And can you remember who Sue Lowther was? I think she was the uh, head of information security. And if we, um, yeah, that, that, that's completely accurate. It, it fits with her signature block. If we um, just read the start of this chain insofar as you were included within it. Um, as was discussed on the conference call and taking into account Rob's comments, uh, to confirm that what we're looking at is a general due diligence exercise on the integrity of Horizon to confirm our belief in the robustness of the system and thus rebut any challenges. Do, do you remember um, this, sort of early 2010? I uh, don't, I don't remember it. Um, but this is an example, as I said, of the messages that there's nothing wrong with Horizon. And that's not having a, a go at Sue. I think she was in the same position as quite a few of us. Uh, looking at the email there, do you think that um, you were part of that conference call? Probably. I, I, can't, I can't remember it. In any event, um, Ms. Lowther continues, the information security team have looked at the information that's been forwarded to them, read the above, and it seems that the issues raised are mainly around procedural items and about accounting reconciliation. To enable us to examine the integrity of Horizon from an in information security perspective, we need input from a number of areas. One, a description of the accounting process from the business perspective, including the interfaces between Horizon and PolFS and the process by which error notices are generated, the identity of all the offices making allegations together with a list of loss uh, declarations from those offices, a report from service delivery of all the problems they've received through the live service desk. And then uh, there is some attribution of actions. And then at the end, at once we ha have that information, I can then put together a plan of how we will examine the system, um, integrity of Horizon, and the resource required to complete it. Do, do you remember this proposal to um, undertake a due diligence exercise on the integrity of Horizon, the purpose of which was to confirm a, an existing belief in the robustness of the system? I don't recall it, no. Uh, if we go um, forwards, please, to um, page seven. And scroll down, please. Uh, just scroll down a little further, please. Uh, Mr. Wilson, a lawyer, do you remember him, Rob Wilson? I do, yes. Uh, it says, I know, I note that you wish to examine the integrity of Horizon from an information security perspective. And then just onto page um, nine. But what does this mean? Yes? Yes. And then back um, to page seven, please. 
uh, middle of the page. Ms. Lowther, essentially it means we wish to examine the security controls we have specified for Horizon and those systems with which it interfaces are indeed in place and working uh, correctly. And then top of the page, please. Mr. Wilson says, we have additional difficulties in relation to challenges to Horizon. Today I've been made aware of a prosecution being conducted uh, by the CPS where Horizon is being challenged. The case may have been already identified by you. The difficulty, however, will be our lack of control over any case that is not being prosecuted by my team. Just stopping there before we get to the questions that arise at the end of this chain. Uh, in what circumstances were cases prosecuted by the CPS? Um, I think they were few and far between. Um, but it may be, for example, a sub-postmaster uh, member of staff was stealing from him. Uh, and if they went directly to the police, they, they may investigate it and they may wish to have the, the, the transaction event logs or, or some other Fujitsu documents to... To examine. And the view that Mr. Wilson expresses here, was that one that was circulating within the investigation community, namely that when the CPS are the prosecutors and the police the investigators, there is a lack of control by the post office over what happens within the case? I, d I don't recall it being, uh, well, I don't recall this anyway, but I don't recall it being uh, communicated. Uh, to others. Can you recall it being a problem or being seen as a problem that... I don't recall it, but I can understand what he's saying, that yes, if it's not being dealt with by his team, um, it, it's obviously not as good as if it were being dealt with by their team. I think that's a matter of debate, but um, here he's talking about control over a case. What would you understand the reference to control being in the context of a debate over a challenge to Horizon? My view on this is that the uh, legal services or criminal law team, by and large, would have oversight over all cases. Um, so that, I mean, they could see patterns or, or problems, etc. If it was being a case of being dealt with by the police or another law enforcement agency, they, they wouldn't have sight. Uh, of the potential problems or issues. That's um, one aspect of control, namely sight, <coughs> potentially. But wouldn't you understand control also to mean control over what is disclosed and what is not disclosed? Um. I, I don't read it like that. The, the difficulty, however, will be our lack of control. If the control is about disclosure, then I would imagine it's up to the police or other law enforcement agency who is investigating the case to deal with the disclosure. Um, however, having said that, yes, I accept that if the police were unaware of uh, potential problems or issues with Horizon, then they wouldn't know to pursue that and disclose anything. If that makes sense. Isn't what Mr. Wilson uh, saying to you, uh, you and the others here that, look, we're planning to uh, potentially investigate Horizon Integrity. We might have to disclose that to the police and the CPS in independently investigated and prosecuted cases. We will lose control over that information. Yes. Whereas if it stays within the post office investigation team, we retain control over that information. Yes. Can we go please to um, at page one? I should have said at the, bo the bottom of the page, please. Um, you um, say, in relation to this chain, can we please ensure that Rob Wilson is kept apprised of um, the situation 
if we just um, read on to page three, and included in any further meetings and updates on this subject, our prosecution cases have faced an increase in challenges as well as our civil cases. So the activities outlined below and indeed going forward are applicable to both um, teams. So you wanted Mr. Wilson cited on the, this idea of a review, a due diligence exercise on Horizon? Yes. And can we see what he replied to you, please? Page one. He says, if it's thought there is a difficulty with Horizon, then clearly the action set out in your memo is not only needed, but um, imperative. The consequence, however, will be that to commence or to continue to proceed with any criminal proceedings will be inappropriate. My understanding is that the integrity of Horizon data is sound. And it is as a result of this that persistent challenges that have been made in court have always failed. These challenges are not new and have been with us since the inception of Horizon, as it has always been the only way that defendants are left to challenge our evidence when they have stolen money or where they need to show that our figures are not correct. By 2010, March 2010, does what Mr. Wilson say in that paragraph reflect the view that you would have held? So, so he, he says it's imperative that he's, he's kept informed. I, I agree, and that's why I asked everyone to make sure that he's kept in the loop, um, because I noticed he wasn't copied in on some of the preceding emails. Um, well, let's take it in stages after then. Um, the third line, he says his understanding is that the integrity of Horizon data is sound. Yes. Did that represent your view by 2010? Yes, so it, it's another example, as I mentioned earlier, about messaging. We had Sue Lowther saying that the system's fine. Here's Rob Wilson saying, as his understanding is, it's fine. Um, and the message from the top was similar. So and who consisted of the top? Well, I've heard things and, and seen things um, about this choir, inquiry that uh, allegedly people much higher up the chain knew things or um, were told there are problems or there might be problems. I don't know the ins and outs or who, the, who those individuals are. I can't remember any particular um, messages coming down, but what I can recall is that there were certainly no messages coming up saying stop investigating or stop prosecuting. So just breaking down what you said there, you can't recall um, any messages coming from the top of the organisation at, at executive team level or similar that filtered their way down to you that there was nothing wrong with Horizon? I can't recall specific messages, no. But that, that was my understanding. Um, and likewise, we've got Rob Wilson here. His understanding is that it's fine. Sue Lowther, her understanding was it's fine. Um, so at my level and, and their level, higher up, I think the impression was that we've been told that this, the system's fine or, or it's working uh, all the time correctly. Uh, moving on, it's as a result of this that persistent challenges that have been made in court have always failed. Would that have been your understanding by 2010? Yes, insofar as I don't recall any challenges being successful. So if that was the case, um, let's say there's been three, six, 12 or 20 challenges and they've been unsuccessful, that, that will, I think that would have, rightly or wrongly, cemented my view that uh, the system was OK. And would it be your understanding that in all of those cases where the challenges had failed, full disclosure had been given of any um, system problems with Horizon, i.e. so that there was a fair hearing that had resulted in a dismissal to the challenge to Horizon? 
my view back then or now? Back then. Back then, I, I, I would have thought everything was done as it should have been. Had you heard of a case call concerning the Cleveleys sub-post office involving uh, Mrs. Walsenholm? I've heard the name Cleveleys, but I don't know anything about it. Had you, would you have known about it by then, by 2010? Or is it something that you've heard in the inquiry? I don't know where I've heard of it, but I've heard of the post office. Had you heard about sub-postmasters being acquitted when they uh, had raised the challenge to Horizon? Not that I recall, but maybe um, in that well, no, I, I don't recall. You, your view, come 2010, would have been that the persistent challenges had always failed. Yes, I, I can't remember any challenges that were successful. There may have been some, but I, I can't remember. Them. Mr. Wilson says these challenges are not new and have been with us since the inception of Horizon. But were you aware that the post office had received complaints concerning the integrity of Horizon data and challenges to Horizon data since the system's very inception? No, um, I don't recall that. And as we've discussed, I was an investigation manager um, from 2000 to 2004. So I would only have had my cases, whereas the legal services team would have had oversight of all cases across the country coming into them. So they may have been aware that there were issues at the beginning, um, but I don't recall that. During your tenure as the investigation manager, which included part of the national rollout that period, what was the message coming down from above as to horizon integrity? Back then, I, d I don't recall any uh, mention of uh, horizon integrity. I, th I think it was more in later years that um, it, it was mentioned. Were you as an investor, that can come down, thank you. Um, were you as an investigation manager given training in relation to uh, the way that Horizon operated and was uh, relevant to your job as an investigator? I would say yes, but I, I can't remember any training that was given. I'm talking about bespoke training in relation to Horizon as an investigator. Again, I, I would say yes, but I, I can't remember the training. How did investigation managers understand the data, uh, the varieties of data that were available for them uh, from Horizon? I don't know how they were made aware. Um, all I can remember is transaction and event logs um, and how to get them off the system. Was the written instructions issued to investigators saying, a key source of our evidence after, say, 2000 is going to be the Horizon system. It's new. We haven't got um, any policy or procedure that relates to getting evidence from this thing. These are, this is a menu of the data that's available. Um, this is what it shows, or this is what it might show, such data. It might help you to prove A or disprove B. And these are the people that you can get it from. I do recall something like that. But it, I, again, I can't remember it, but it was very more simplified. It was how to obtain a transaction log, do ABC, how to obtain an event log, do XYZ, and so on. And I think it was a one sheet of paper. <laughs> yeah. And was that a, a within your team document, or was it a, something that was... Con a, applicable countrywide? I can't remember, and I don't know whether it was drafted by someone in our team or, or one of the prime risk team, or, or even borrowed from the audit team, I don't know. When you were acting as an investigation manager, what determined whether you would investigate 
uh, or not? What were the relevant considerations? For an investigation? Yeah. Um, well, as an, an investigation manager, it would be whether my investigation team manager had allocated a case to me. You tell us in your witness statement there's no need to turn it up. Um, it's paragraph 43. Um, in relation to deciding whether and in what circumstances to investigate, quote, the decision was informed by a number of factors, including the shortfall and the current resource and workloads within the teams. Is that correct? <coughs> yeah. So leaving aside for the moment the amount of the alleged um, shortfall and focusing on the current workloads within the team, do you mean by that that the workload of the criminal investigation and debt recovery teams played a part in deciding whether an alleged shortfall would be pursued as a crime or as a debt? The, the investigation team, yes. We had nothing to do with the um, debt recovery team. And if I could just give you an example, over the year, I mean, I, I think when I started, there was about 60 investigators um, and something like nine or ten teams and over the years that went down to two or three teams and about 20 investigators so as the staff reduced the workload didn't reduce as much probably like most businesses and there, there, there came a time where you know investigators were swamped with work so did that affect the quality of the investigation that they were able to carry out it would have done if they'd retained that work um, but i do remember we had to be quite um, hard and say, right, well, we're not investigating, sorry, we're not investigating this out or the other. And what was the this, know. that or the other that you wouldn't investigate? Um, lower value audit shortages, um, pension what? amounts, overclaims that were of a certain amount. On um, alleged shortfalls, was there, um, what, if any, was the limit or the, the floor be beneath which you wouldn't go in an investigation? I can't remember a particular figure, um, but I do remember, I, th I think I put my statement about triggers and time scales. I'm sorry? Triggers and time scales? Yes. And can you, can you now remember what the triggers were? I can't remember, no. But they, did, they, they fluctuated. Um, and it, even when we were agreed on a, a trigger, if someone's gone long-term sick and um, someone's left, then again, that still wouldn't be set in stone as for us to investigate. And notwithstanding the use of these um, uh, triggers, did it um, nonetheless remain the case that teams had an overstretched capacity to investigate? At, at times, yes. When, when I mentioned we had nine, about 1960 investigators, back then, I think, probably like other law enforcement agencies, we would investigate anything and everything that came our way. Uh, as time went on, staff became less, so you had to prioritise more what you actually investigated. Was there any uh, drop in the extent and quality of the investigations that were conducted? Not that I recall. So quality has always remained the same? I believe so. It's right, isn't it, that you were set objectives to recover uh, a certain amount, a certain percentage of fraud activity, weren't you? Yes. Uh, can we look, please, at poll 0012 6734? Uh, these are your um, objectives for um, your personal objectives for um, the year April 2012 to March 2013. Was this a, a feature of um, all of your time as um, an investigator and, and uh, th at this time in, in fraud recovery? Uh, so every year we had objectives. Um I'm not sure when I was an investigator we had a target for recoveries. At this time that we're looking, April 2012, March 2013, you're a, 
um, an accredited financial investigator. Yes. Are you saying that you don't remember targets for recovery in the earlier period that I was looking at, 2000 to 2004, when you were an investigations manager? That's correct. I think, I think the recovery was important, but I don't remember it being an actual objective like it is here in later years. And if we just scroll down and look at um, box three, please. Uh, under the heading fraud activity return on investment. And um, fraud activity return on investment. Investment means sort of investment in you, does it? Yes. Um, I, post office saying we're employing you to investigate um, as a financial investigator losses and seek to recover them. Yes. We are making an investment. We want to see what the return is on our investment in employing you. Yes. So is that what that heading means? I think so. Um, and I think it says that um, uh, evidence activity that produces recovery rates on inquiries closed of 65% or more subject to quarterly review. Can you tell us what that figure means, 65% or more, i.e. 65% or more of what? Right, so 65% uh, or more on closed cases. But so, of what? what, what? Well, it, if there's been 10 cases in the year, um, and all of them were £10,000 losses. The total is £100,000 of loss, so the recovery target would be 65000 Okay, so it means that you have got to produce evidence that shows that of the total amount of shortfalls for that year, i.e. the alleged losses, yeah. you have recovered 65% of those. Yes. So it doesn't mean in 65% of cases... And it doesn't mean in 65% um, of cases there must be some recovery. It's by reference to the total figure. Yes. And can we see similarly for the next year, poll 0012, 6836. Uh, these are your objectives for April 2013 to March 2014. Um, fraud activity return on investment, um, evidence activity that produces recovery rates on closed inquiries of 65% or more. So the same? Yeah. And do you know why um, it, one of your performance objectives was the um, recovery of such a, um, a number of the alleged shortfalls? The particular number, I don't know why it's 65%, um, but I can understand if you're a finan accredited financial investigator, your job is to uh, get money back for the business. Was that a consistent theme throughout your time as an investigator and then as an, an AFI? As an AFI, yes. As an investigator, I can't remember, but that, you know, there was a recovery element to the role. Uh, can we look, please, at poll 0012 6944? Just pause there a moment. We, um, looks like we may have lost the connection with uh, the chairman. <coughs> Sorry, I was muted. I was saying that there was a very small period of time, no more than seconds, but I think I lost connection, but I've been um, following all that's happened without a problem. 
Okay, so we can't see you at the moment for, um, right. for okay. some reason, but which um, it, it's slightly um, discombobulating to hear a yeah. voice um, without a, a picture because we don't know whether you're here or, or not. Oh, well, I, I, I can assure everyone that I am here, but um, obviously you, it's necessary that I, that I can be seen. Yes, you can now, sir. Um, right. You're back in the room. Uh, can we look, please, at this document, um, which looks like uh, the outcome of a performance review against the objectives that we've just looked at. It's dated, um, or it's for the period, uh, April to October 2013. Can you see that? Yes. And if we just scroll down on the one that we're looking at, the ROI, return on investment, it says 72% recovery rate against closed cases across um, the team. So you, you exceeded the 65% um, uh, target. And then you um, set out uh, the things that you did in order to <coughs> do that, essentially. Yes? Yes. Did these recovery targets, getting in money, impinge on the way that you and your team went about its work in relation to sub-postmasters? Not that I remember, no. We've got to get the money in. There's an objective. Well, we've got to get the money in is, is the objective, um, but if there is no money, um, I wouldn't say it's the luck of the draw, but some cases there isn't any money, some cases there is. Um, what, what were the consequences for you in missing targets? The potential consequences were, I don't want to go into too much detail, but on our PDRs, you've got a score of five, which was excellent, four was very good, three was good, two was improvement required, and one was poor. So if, if you didn't hit the targets, I might have gone from good to improvement required. So it, it affected your PDR score, uh, which in turn would affect your bonus that you got as well. Well, I was about to ask, was the achievement of the target in getting money in from sub-postmasters linked to remuneration? And the answer is yes. It was linked to remuneration for me and others. Um, but, as I say, I mean, if, if, let's say that was 50%, I could demonstrate, well, you know, couldn't get money in these cases because there weren't any. So I would have argued the toss if I hadn't hit the, the required target. And was, um, were all financial investigators uh, on a, a bonus scheme in the link to the recovery of money from sub-postmasters? Yes, and everyone within the security team was on uh, a bonus, depending on their own objectives. Uh, what were the other bonus metrics for other members of the security team? I, I, I don't know. I mean, a, a crime risk analyst, their, their day job is more analytics and... What about a straight investigator? The investigator, as, as I say, I can't recall when I was an investigator, there was a, a specific target. Um, and I, I, can't, I, mean, I can't remember what, if any, target they had in later years. Here you are um, telling a manager, presumably, um, in this sentence, the second sentence, I've continued to secure impressive recoveries, um, something in order to justify your bonus. Indeed. At this time, um, and we're here late 2013, had you any knowledge at all of any horizon integrity issues? Not specifically, just, um, well, if I could call it noise. What um, so, so noise in my mind means something that's going on in the background that's a bit um, annoying and um, something you'd rather not pay attention to. 
Right. Is that how you're referring to noise? No. Um, what do you mean by horizon integrity issues were just noise? Right. What I mean is, um, I mean, I can't be specific in terms of which years, but there would be some noise, i.e. people citing horizon. As the years went on, there may be more offices or, or people citing horizon. Um, it's a bit of a, like a snowball effect. It sort of gathers momentum as the years go on. Is that how you viewed it, that it was just momentum gathering? Um, Rather than potentially the true picture emerging, having been uh, either not investigated or suppressed for a period of time? Yeah. Again, I'll be honest, I, I viewed it as, um, <coughs> as you've outlined at the time. So it's something that was just gathering momentum because it was being mentioned in the press and yes. amongst the sub-postmaster community. Yes, and myself, and uh, as we've mentioned, uh, Rob Wilson and others um, didn't know or believe there was a problem. That well, no, nobody assured. More than that, they were saying that there isn't. Yes, indeed. D did you ever know what their view was based on? No, but I presume it's the same as mine, that business were constantly saying there's nothing wrong with it, there's nothing wrong with it, which I always found a bit strange myself. Um, Why did you find it strange? Because my view is that every computer system has problems or glitches, so I think it was too strong to say there is nothing wrong with it and it's working at all times. I mean, I'm sure we've all been in a supermarket, um, half price item, you get to the till and it comes up as full price. I'm sure we've all been on our PCs and some message comes up saying you, you can't access this, you haven't got the rights. Yeah, I've not even act wanted to access it. On a grander scale, you've got air traffic control across the world, so I mean, every computer system, in my view, does have some uh, issues with it, so I, th I think the post office is quite strong there. But that doesn't mean that I thought there was anything systemically wrong with Horizon, and that seemed to have been backed up by uh, witness statements obtained by Fujitsu. Presumably linking bonuses to the amount of money that you recovered from sub-postmasters was intended to affect your behaviour. Yes, um, but when you say that, it affected my behaviour in so far as I would do what I could within the realms of the Proceeds of Crime Act. How did it affect your behaviour, knowing that you were on a bonus if you got more money in? Well, even putting that aside, that, that was my job, to get money back. Um, and I utilised uh, primarily confiscation orders uh, which was within the realms of the Proceeds of Crime Act and only following a conviction. So I utilised the powers um, in the appropriate way. That can come down, thank you. In your witness statement, you tell us, no need to turn it up, it's paragraphs 19 and 20. Um, you refer to your role in relation to case strategies. Right. And in paragraph 25, you refer to involvement in the development or management of policies. Who was responsible for criminal litigation strategy at the post office? I think it was the head of security and the senior security manager within that strand. Did you ever see um, criminal litig litigation strategy described? I may have seen a, a, a policy, like a prosecution policy, if that was the same thing. I can rem remember it, but I, I don't know the details of it. Uh, can you, uh, in general terms, uh, describe what the post office criminal litigation strategy was, say, between 2000 and 2004? No. And what about at a later stage, when you were an AFI? I don't recall. How would you describe it now, looking back at it?
but that one element or one focus is to recover monies owed. Was that the principal purpose of the criminal litigation strategy? I'm not sure it was the, the principal reason. Um, again, my, my recollection was that, that there was a policy to prosecute. Um, if it was in the public interest um, and you know whatever rules or guidance that needed to be followed by primarily the criminal law team. The recoveries were a significant part of them. Some organisations have a, um, or would describe themselves as having a robust uh, criminal investigation and prosecution policy. Some would say that they have a weak or a tolerant criminal investigation policy or, or, or strategy. Uh, some might impose um, thresholds for investigation and prosecution that are exceedingly high, um, meaning that not much gets investigated or prosecuted. Uh, where in the spectrum uh, did the post office sit, say, in 2000 to 2004 when you were an investigation manager? I, I don't know because I can't compare to, to those. Other. All I can say is recoveries were important and they grew more important as time went on. And was it explained to you why recovery of money was important, seen as important? The only thing I can recall was that different parts of the post office uh, generated profits for the business, whereas security investigations were more of a cost. So in order to redress that balance in some way, that's why invest uh, recoveries became more of a focus. And so the, the recovery of uh, debt, as you called it, from sub-postmasters was seen as a way of contributing to the post office's bottom line? Yes. Thank you. So it's half past 12. Uh, I wonder whether that would be an appropriate moment to break just for half an hour until one o'clock. Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you very much, sir.